Hi, this is Tom Quine. This is the April 15th, 2018th version of the Humanity video cast. Uh, I'm speaking to you today, as you can see, from the wilds of British Columbia. Well, actually, from the woods just right behind my house. And uh, I, I brought you here because I would just like to show you something very cool. There's been a lot of beaver activity behind my house, and uh, this beaver is trying to build a dam in the little creek. And I thought it was very cool. I just thought I would show you what the beaver is up to. But today I'm not here to talk to you about beavers. Uh, I'm here because I want to talk to you about truth. Uh, I hope that you caught my audio podcast on the, uh, on the meaning of truth. Uh, if you didn't, I'll summarize it uh, later in this video. Uh, but for now, uh, let's talk about, well, before I talk about truth, let me talk about something important, which is bad hair. Okay, this fellow you're looking at is James Traficant. He was an, an Ohio congressman until he was sentenced to seven years for taking bribes, evading taxes, racketeering, uh, as well as forcing his congressional aides to do farm labor on his ranch. And this next guy is Boris Johnson, one of the leaders of the parade of lies and falsehoods known as Brexit. And next up here is another Brexiteer, Michael Fabricant, also known as Fabricant the Fabricator. In the Brexit campaign, people like Boris Johnson and Michael Fabricant argued that Britain should leave the European Union because, you know, the brave and independent people of England should not be taking orders from Germany or from Brussels. Instead, they should be taking orders from people like Boris Johnson and Michael Fabricant. Next up, this is John Bolton, a prominent warmonger in the Trump administration. Bolton was one of the first to argue for the disastrous war in Iraq, and he was one of those who lied most loudly about Saddam's weapons of mass destruction. He's currently threatening North Korea with nuclear annihilation. And this is a guy who once said, if you need a man with a bad toupee in the United Nations, I'm your guy. You know, he was described uh, by his former colleagues in the State Department as someone who, quote, kissed up and kicked down and who, quote, told an awful lot of lies, end of quote. Next up, Kim Jong-un. Uh, Supreme Leader of North Korea. I think we know where he got his hairstyling inspiration. Okay, we know this guy. That I don't need to say very much about him. Let's move on. And we also know this guy, who according to the fact checkers, lies to the public five or ten times a day. Now we don't know how often he lies in private every day to those close to him, but we can pretty much guess and not only does he have the hair working for him, but he also has a fake orange tan so that he can radiate good health at us. Okay, so why am I talking about bad hair in a podcast about truth? Because it's a video cast. Because I want to make a point. If you, if you know what you're looking for, you can spot a liar from 100 meters. Because their very appearance is a lie. That's the first lie they tell you. First lie they tell themselves. They wake up in the morning, they look in the mirror, and they tell themselves, you know what, I think if I wear my hair like this, I can con everyone around me into thinking that, hey, I look pretty good. They have a distorted self-image, they have a bulletproof ego, they are narcissists, and a narcissist, you know what, cares a lot about what he wants, but he doesn't care at all about what you want. So people will use their hair and their facial hair is a form of branding that makes them instantly recognizable. You know, they're saying with their face, they're saying, everybody look at me. I'm not somebody who just melts into the crowd. Don't forget this face because I am pretty special. To give you an example, here's an icon. Everybody knows instantly who this is. That's what branding is. 
So, point one, understand that your appearance is a form of communication. First impressions are very important. What you wear, how you look, your face and your hair, send a message. So, when you see somebody coming at you like this, understand that the first message they're putting forward is a lie. And it's not only a little white lie. Maybe it seems kind of harmless to overlook. Maybe you think, okay, it would be rude to insult the man to his face. So, you know what, I'm going to let it slide. But I warn you, if you buy that first little lie, some bigger ones are coming up. Because this is how a con man gains your confidence. Their opening gambit is always this. I'm asking you to accept that I am what I say I am. I'm your friend. I'm not here trying to con you. And that's how they get their foot in the door. So my advice to you Trump voters and Brexit voters, because apparently you didn't get it last time around, but maybe now it's starting to dawn on you that you're being taken for a ride. Next time you see a guy with hair like this coming at you, and he's trying to sell you, I don't know, maybe a get-rich-quick real estate course, or a used car that was only driven on Sundays, or maybe a nuclear war, you know what, hold on to your wallet tightly, turn around and walk away, because otherwise you are going to get conned. Okay, so let's return to our topic, which is, how can we tell when something is true or not? Uh, if somebody claims that a statement is true, this is what is known as a truth claim. So how can we tell when a truth claim is valid? Well, a couple of things we need to understand first off about truth. Number one, there is no such thing as absolute truth. The concept of absolute truth, that's a religious concept. It's not a scientific concept. The reason being that What's true in one set of circumstances might not be true in another. What's true in one environment might not be true in another. What's true for you might not be true for me. What's true for one set of objectives might not be true for another set of objectives. Truth is not like that. What truth is, is a proposition about reality that has a greater or lesser degree of probability. Okay, I'm out here on my deck and I just want to show you that uh, behind me the sun is shining and uh, so I'm going to make a truth claim here. The truth claim is the sun is shining. It's daytime and the sun is shining. Okay, I'm out here late at night and I'm going to make the same statement. The sun is shining. Now you can see that it's nighttime, I'm out on my deck, and the sun is not shining. That's because the truth claim, the sun is shining, is relative to the circumstances in which the claim is made. So truth is relative. If I go outside and it's daytime and the sun is shining and I say the sun is shining and the sun actually is shining, that's a true statement. But if I go out at nighttime and I say the sun is shining, then that statement is no longer true because the truth of a statement depends on the circumstances to which it applies. This should be obvious. Now, there are a group of people, uh, sometimes known as the postmodernists or the truth relativists or moral relativists, who argue that, okay, because truth is relative, it loses all of its meaning. What's true for you is not true for me. What's true in one culture is not true in another culture. What's true at one time is not true at this time. And so therefore, this truth thing, it's all just, uh, it's all just nonsense. It's all meaningless. The only thing that really matters is a naked struggle for power. Okay, this is why they call, uh, this is why they call Donald Trump the first postmodernist president, because this is how he acts. He acts as if truth doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is winning. He's, a, he's all about winning. He's a winner. Uh, and people who tell the truth are sometimes losers. The truth is not what matters. What matters is winning. That is false. Because there is such a thing as truth. In certain circumstances, there is a truth to be found. If the sun is shining and I say the sun is shining, that is a true statement.
Okay, here's another very important thing to understand about truth, which is truth is a tool that we use to accomplish a certain goal or objective. And you can't really understand a truth claim, you can't test its validity, unless you understand the objective that it's meant to serve. So let me give you an example. Uh, you will hear Donald Trump, uh, John Bolton, other members of the Republican Party say that torture is effective. Quote unquote, torture is effective. You need to ask yourself, effective for what? To what goal or end? Because we know that torture is very effective at extracting confessions. And the reason for that is that people will confess to just about anything in order to stop the torture. However, the experience of the waterboarding uh, that the American government did uh, post-Iraq uh, shows that no useful information was gained from this form of torture. So therefore, always pay attention to what the goal or objective is that's stated there. Another way that you can test the validity of a truth claim is by asking, who has made this claim? Is this person a genuine authority on the subject uh, that they're talking about? Now, uh, this is in, in philosophy, this is called the argument from authority. Um, you know, uh, we use the argument from authority all the time. If I want a legal opinion, I'm going to go and see a lawyer because I know that a lawyer is an authority on the law. And if I have a medical problem, I'm going to go and see a doctor and I will trust their opinion because I know that doctors are authorities on medicine. And if I have, uh, if I want to know something about uh, climate change, I might want to go and see a climate scientist because that person will be an authority. Now, not all people are trustworthy authorities. We know, for instance, that many, you know, certainly uh, many politicians lie. Uh, we have seen, for example, many religious leaders lie uh, and abuse their authority and abuse the people who trusted their authority and uh, so this is why in the 1960s they came up with the slogan question authority ask yourself who is telling me this why are they telling me this are they trustworthy uh, if somebody has said to me 3,000 lies in the past then surely the probability that they're telling me the truth now goes down somewhat uh, so always question authority and uh, make sure that uh, what they're saying is valid. Now, another method you can use to assess the validity of a truth claim is uh, reason or common logic, classical logic. So how does logic work? Well, uh, basically you establish some premises, and on the basis of the premises, you make a conclusion. So a classical example would be, uh, Joe is not married. That's premise number one. Premise number two, all unmarried men are bachelors. And so these two premises, you put them together and you come to a conclusion, Joe is a bachelor. Okay? Um, another example, all American presidents have been men, premise number one. Premise number two, Hillary Clinton is a woman, therefore conclusion, Hillary Clinton is not the President of the United States. Okay, so let's apply this uh, to some real world examples. For example, a good example is uh, Bill Clinton back uh, back way back when made a claim about the Monica Lewinsky case uh, quote this is a truth claim I did not have sex with that woman so now let's assess this truth claim and see what we can learn let's let's take a look at some premises here premise number one many politicians are guilty of sexual impropriety I think that's a valid premise premise number two Bill Clinton has a history of being accused by women of sexual impropriety. Premise number three, some women are attracted to powerful men. 
So we can, on the basis of this, let me just add here that I, 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 there, there, there's an argument to be made that many men go into politics because they are aware that some women are attracted to powerful men. And for them, a political career is, is, is a form of male sexual display behavior. It's a kind of a peacock thing. Uh, but I digress. I'm just saying, on the basis of the premises that we know, we can then perhaps draw a conclusion. But let me introduce something else here, which is called Occam's Razor. Occam's Razor was invented by a fellow named William Occam back in the late Middle Ages. And it's called Occam's Razor because it's a way of slicing very quickly through a problem. And what William of Occam basically argued, I'm being very basic here, is that the simplest explanation is probably the correct explanation. So if we apply this William of Ockham's razor to the Bill Clinton situation, let's look for the simplest explanation, and that's probably the correct one. And we can apply this same logic to Trump's statement that he did not know Stormy Daniels and he had had no relationship, did not even know who the woman was. William of Ockham would say, Okay, what's the simplest explanation here? Okay, now we come to the clincher, which is evidence. Uh, if you have evidence, uh, you can use this as a valid premise in your logical argument that either proves or disproves a truth claim. So, for example, if we take uh, Bill Clinton's truth claim that, quote, I did not have sex with that woman, end of quote, uh, there is evidence to the contrary uh, because Bill Clinton's semen stains were found on Monica Lewinsky's dress. Now, you could, uh, you could come up with a, uh, a fantastical explanation. There's a huge right-wing conspiracy and... The, um, the FBI somehow tapped uh, Bill Clinton's nocturnal emissions and took that and uh, stained it onto Monica Lewinsky's dress without his knowledge, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and politicians seem to be, you know, experts at coming up with these kind of crazy and plausible explanations for their own sexual impropriety. Uh, but ask yourself, what's the simplest explanation? Similarly, uh, Donald Trump said that he had never met Stormy Daniels, did not know the woman. However, we do have a picture of him with Stormy Daniels, and uh, we also know that his lawyer paid Stormy $130,000 in hush money. So ask yourself, what's the simplest explanation? We have another truth claim from Donald Trump that he will, quote, make America great again, end of quote. My response to that is, show me the evidence. Okay, so we've now reached the conclusion of our video cast. And as you can see, I'm back outside. Uh, it's daytime, the sun is shining. Um, and I wanna thank you for your patience. I know I've gone on for a long time, but uh, you know, I had a lot to say for myself, and I think truth is an important topic. So, uh, and if you if you like this video cast, uh, please do uh, give me a thumbs up. Uh, I'll be producing more content very soon. So, uh, also subscribe to my channel to, if you want to see more, and uh, leave a comment below. I'll try to answer all comments. Um, and if you can visit my website at humanity.ca, and there you will find links to my video cast. Uh, to my bro uh, to my blog, to my podcast, and to other content that you might find interesting. So, in the final segment, I want to return to a truth claim that I made right at the very beginning, and the truth claim was there has been some beaver activity behind my house. Um, <clears throat> now, I notice that I didn't say there was a beaver behind my house because actually, uh, I haven't seen any sign of this beaver for over a month now. I never did actually see the beaver itself. Uh, 
And what I suspect has happened is that the city authorities have trapped the beaver and took it back up into the mountains and released it into the wild. Because of course, if the beaver dams up the creek in a residential neighborhood, it's gonna cause some flooding. That's not good. So normally they take wild animals and release them. And I think that's what happened here. But what I would like to do is use the truth claim there has been some beaver activity behind my house as a kind of a test, uh, as a kind of a case study that we can use to test out some of the tools that we discussed in the video. So if you'll bear with me, let's walk through those and see what we learn. Okay, so let's test this truth claim using uh, one of the first criteria that I mentioned, which is the intention or motivation uh, behind the truth claim. What, what purpose, what goal or objective does this truth claim serve? Uh, there's beaver activity behind my house. Why did I bring this into the equation? Uh, so let's look at some possible reasons. Uh, number one, I might just really think beaver activity is very cool and want to share that. Uh, number two, uh, I've made the claim that I am a Canadian. Uh, we know that the beaver is a Canadian icon. It's an iconic Canadian animal. We know that Canadians love their national symbols. Uh, therefore, Canadians are a beaver-loving people. And uh, maybe I just wanted to situate myself in British Columbia as a Canadian, as somebody who loves beavers, and there therefore perhaps to just establish a greater level of trust. Maybe you think I'm more trustworthy if you know who I am and where I am. Um, it may be that I wanted to have a case study that we could use to test out some of the concepts that we learned for testing the validity of a truth claim. And uh, the beaver example was a good one to work with. It may also be that I just wanted to provide some entertainment value because discussing truth can be kind of a little bit uh, dry. It can be a dry subject matter. And so if I bring you outside and we talk about beavers a little bit, it adds a little bit more interest to it. So in discussing the motivation for using this, uh, for, for making this truth claim, the answer is probably a little bit of all of the above. Okay, so the next tool that we can use to assess the validity of a truth claim is the argument from authority. So is Tom any kind of an authority on beaver activity that he can talk to us about that in any uh, reliable way? Well, we know that Tom has claimed that he's a Canadian and uh, he's never lied to us before. He doesn't have any history of lying to us. So if we give him the benefit of the doubt, let's assume that he's a Canadian. And we know that uh, Canadians um, love their beavers. Uh, the beaver is an iconic Canadian animal um, and Canadians love their national symbols and therefore Canadians are a beaver loving people and it's probable that Canadians have had some kind of experience maybe the majority not in the wild but you know they know a little bit about beavers from what they've seen on television or at the zoo or perhaps in the wild they have direct experience and so they may be able to recognize beaver activity when they see it. Uh, but none of this proves that Tom is any kind of a reliable authority on beaver activity. You know, um, he hasn't lied to us in the past, but he hasn't proven his truth claim is, uh, is valid on the basis of his authority on the subject of beaver activity. But he hasn't, we haven't disproved it either. So let's just let that one slide. Okay, the next tool in our tool chest for assessing the validity of a truth claim is basic logic. So let's, uh, let's establish some facts and let's see if we can make a conclusion on the basis of these facts. Fact number one, we know that, uh, well, we are assuming that Tom is a Canadian and he's in Canada. Fact number two, we know that the beaver is a Canadian animal. It lives beside the water. It likes to fell trees uh, close to a creek. It likes to build dams so it can have a nice little lake uh, where it can raise its family. And uh, so we know these facts about the beaver. We know that Tom hasn't lied to us and uh, 
we can't really see any good logical reason why he would start lying to us about something as trivial as a beaver being behind his house. And so the whole thing holds together. It's, got, it's logically plausible. So let's let this one go too. We haven't disproved the truth claim and it's, we've, we've discovered it's, it's logically possible. Okay, the next tool we have at our disposal is evidence. And this is the clincher, because I showed you some video of uh, the beaver damage that was done. I showed you fallen trees. I'll show you again with tooth marks on them. Now we know that the beaver is uh, an animal that chews down trees with its teeth. It's highly unlikely that you could reproduce the look of that, uh, you know, uh, falsely. It, it, it does appear as if from the photograph that a beaver has chewed down this tree. And so, that's strong support uh, in, uh, in, uh, for this truth claim. Now, of course, you could come up with a fantastical conspiracy theory that would refute this claim. You could say, for instance, that, well, there's no way Tom is a Canadian. Um, there's no way that landscape looks like uh, Canada. I mean, he's right beside a highway. You can hear the traffic going by. There's no way a beaver would be that close to the highway. And anyway, you know, he could easily have cut down those trees himself and then he's falsified all of these tooth marks in some way. And it's all part of a big conspiracy. It's all a big hoax. Now, if you hear something like that, you can use something called Occam's razor, which we discussed. Occam's razor is just great for undermining crazy conspiracy theories. Because all you have to do is ask yourself, what's the simplest explanation here? Okay, the last tool I'm going to discuss uh, for assessing the validity of a truth claim is intuition. Now, intuition is, uh, is interesting because <clears throat> it's often, it comes out of your deep subconscious and it often expresses itself emotionally or physically and not as a rational thought and, and therefore it's kind of easy to dismiss it because you say, I don't understand it. Uh, I don't know where it's coming from. And for this reason, Intuition can be a very unreliable guide to the uh, validity, you know, to assessing a truth claim. Uh, because, you know, we know that politicians and con men, for example, can, you know, are, they're experts at appealing to your basest instincts. And so sometimes you can get a bad feeling about something or a good feeling about something that's not based on anything rational or logical, but it's based on something emotional. It's based on your gut instincts. For example, uh, earlier in this video, I made the claim that people with bad hair can be trust untrustworthy. They might be liars. Now that's a that's a very dubious claim to make because there's a lot of people out there who have bad hair, and they're not con men. They're not trying to take your money. They just have bad hair. But I'll tell you how I feel when I come across somebody who is an obvious phony. I get a queasy feeling in my middle. I get a sense that there's something not quite right here. And when I get that feeling, I trust that feeling. I put my hand on my wallet and I put my defenses up very high. If I come across somebody who is, has bad hair, who talks maybe a little bit too fast, who smiles maybe a little bit too much, I'm very cautious about accepting any truth claim that comes out of them. So, you know, sometimes you can trust your gut and sometimes it's a good indicator and sometimes you can't. And so sometimes when you get a feeling that, you know, uh, I just feel in my gut that this is right or I just feel in my gut that this is wrong. Maybe you need to step back a bit and apply some rational criteria, some logical criteria. You need to ask who you're talking to and so on and so forth because maybe your gut feeling is wrong and maybe it needs to be backed up with some more rational argument. Okay, so uh, as I say, I've talked long enough. Now I'm concluding. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please leave a comment below. And uh, last, lastly, let me say, how do you... Let, let me ask you the question, how do you know that Tom is trustworthy and uh, reliable and uh, is not telling you a lie here? Well, in response, all I can say is, look at the hair. I'm not trying to con anybody. <laughs>